we wouldn't be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you are familiar with Anna Marie Roper? Yes, of course. Um, she uh, kept our feet to the fire and she was our conscience. So those of us who are here this morning, um, we do appreciate the, uh, the foundation of our field and the people who made a difference. So Lita Stetter Hollingworth started the first gifted class, wrote the first book on gifted education. You wouldn't be at NAGC because there wouldn't be an NAGC if there wasn't a Lita. She really started it all. And if you'd like more information about her, we've got Tom Chemnitz in the back who is an appreciator of history and her values. And this is a book about her, America's first gifted program and the Spire School program that he published by Willard White. And there's Patty Gatta Walden. And did you bring Michael? I didn't bring Michael. Oh, that's right, that's Susan. Sorry, got my, got mixed up. So I'm hoping that Michael will uh, show up. He's our Global Awareness Network Award winner, so please come and celebrate him on Sunday morning. Um, so this is, um, an article that just came out, and I haven't held the journal until this moment when Marsha Ruff gave it to me. From Marsha is the director of the Roper Institute at the Roper School, and uh, the Roper Review, which is named for the Ropers, of course, and the Roper School, is uh, the. There they are, Susan Daniels and Michael Piofsky are making their grand entrance. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. So Michael is our Global Awareness Network Award winner. And uh, I don't know how many of you will be able to celebrate him Sunday morning, so I'd like you to give him a round of applause now. He, he won the Anna Marie Roper Global Awareness Award. And don't think that's easy. <laughs> so this is, it, I did not prepare a handout because I'm hoping that you'll actually get Roper Review. How many of you are subscribers? Oh no. Well, I found out sadly enough from Marsha that you can't just go and buy this one issue. You can if you go to Taylor and Francis, which she'll tell you how to do. But um, if you just want the single issue, you might as well just get a subscription. <laughs> they, they charge a little bit for the issue itself, about $30. But it's a fantastic issue. This is Leslie Hosey, who's the uh, head of the lower school at Roper, and Leslie, went wild after she read this issue and wrote this glowing letter about it. So this is one of the articles in, in this terrific issue about the Roper School that's celebrating its 75th anniversary. And um, the message is simple, but it's a message that is shared by uh, the founder of our uh, field and the founder of Global Awareness Network. A garden is not a competition. The tallest flower is not the most prized. The profusion of diverse varieties, colors, shapes, sizes, growth patterns, and fragrances, I suppose I should stand here so I can, you can hear me better, make a garden interesting and inviting. Every garden is unique, as is every flower in the garden. Lita Hollingworth, the foremother of gifted education, and Anna Marie Roper, our field's philosopher, adored their gardens. And they appreciated the uniqueness of each blossom. And they dearly loved gifted children, appreciating the inner beauty of each one. Their legacy is the philosophy of child-centeredness. How many of you are aware of child-centered philosophy? You know, I thought I knew all about it, and then I decided just for the heck of it to go on Google and see what Google said child-centeredness was. And I 
I was delighted that I learned some new things. Uh, so I put my own spin on it, but this is how I think of child-centeredness. It's an I-thou relationship with a child, which honors this unique individual's equal rights, personality, qualities, feelings, ideas, preferences, learning styles, interests. Anna Marie always urged us to follow the child's inner agenda rather than to impose our own agenda on the child. That was huge. And that's a big part of the foundation of the Roper School. And when you do that, you're giving that child a very good message about who they are and how they're valued. It conveys to the child you are important, much more important than your grades, than your potential, than your future direction. You're worth listening to. I want to know what you feel and what you think. I'm interested in you as a person. Have you ever been really seen? Not for your potential and not for what you do for others, but for who you are. <clears throat> this is what Lita Hollingworth and Anna Marie did. They saw gifted children for who they are. From a child-centered perspective, childhood is not preparation for life. It is life. Every moment of a child's life is precious. And uh, I'm glad Michael is here to hear this because much of this presentation is based on a wonderful, wonderful article that he and Barry Grant wrote in 1999 called Theories and the Good Toward a Child-Centered Gifted Education. And uh, I, I think that if you haven't read this, please find it and read it. It will be an eye-opener for you. It traces the lineage of the great child-centered educators, such as Rousseau and Froebel and Montessori. And that's where child-centeredness came from, although Michael introduces me to someone I never heard of called Quintilian? Yeah, he was the first one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I need to learn more. And then he, they finished the article by talking about Lita Hollingworth and Anna Marie Roper. And this is, these are quotes from this article. First and foremost, we have to be child-centered, not as lip service, but wholeheartedly. Being child-centered means respecting children's autonomy, providing experiences that enable children to follow their passions and be self-actualizing, and seeking to understand things from the child's point of view. The strongest argument for child-centeredness is that it regards children as ends, not means. It provides conditions for children to flourish, become themselves, and it does not impose a way of being on them. An understanding of the child's perspective and inner life aids us in assisting children in finding their own way in life. <clears throat> By pushing conventional success and achievement, for example, good grades, high status, high paying jobs, stability. We push children away from who they are. What we need to do is simple. Stop pressuring children to perform and achieve on our terms. Stop weighing children's worth in the currency of accomplishments. Stop killing intrinsic motivation. And give up the fear that children will be unsuccessful. Allow children their own route to self-actualization. Otherwise, no self-actualization is possible. So these are um, interesting that we can't see that. OK. Um, the purpose of education, according to Lita, 
I'm missing part of it and I don't have a slide here to show me what it says. Um, but she, uh, it was to look at the whole child, their emotional and aesthetic and cognitive and affective development, um, much like Patty's model of, of the, the heart and the mind and the body and the spirit. It, that was Lita's as well. The role of the teacher is to act as a facilitator of learning and emotional growth to assist with the problems arising out of the disparities between mental and chronological age. Now, many of you who are uh, familiar with the term asynchronous development will recognize that this is the basis of it. And Patty, uh, Gata Walden, and Michael Piahovsky, and I are part of that Columbus group. And we relied a great deal on Anna Marie and Michelle didn't see you. When did you come in? <laughs> Michelle Kane <laughs> uh, is also a part of that group. And, sh and um, we, we relied a great deal on Anna Marie and Lita's work in coming up with this definition. And Anna Marie was a part of the Columbus group. So now we're missing the purpose of education. Uh, okay. Pardon? Uh, can't get the rest of it. But the role of teachers was to be role models in charge of their own destinies, aware of who they are, facilitators of learning and the growth of the self. A good match between teacher and child is essential. So what's really important here is that for Anna Marie, the teacher had to be in a growthful, growing position in order to help children to grow emotionally, personally. So it wasn't just a, a thing about the kids. It was the entire school community had to be devoted to personal growth. Instead of being valued for what they can produce, the gifted need to be cherished for who they are and the unusual ways they think and feel. So as I said, the Roper School is celebrating its 75th anniversary. And this is a philosophical statement or a little excerpt of one uh, that Anna Marie wrote. This philosophy is based on the belief of self-actualization respecting the growth and the uniqueness of each member of the community, as well as the reality of mutual interdependence. This philosophy only becomes a reality through its implementation. So now we're not talking about personal growth for the person anymore. We're talking about personal growth within an educational context in which the entire school resonates with that and supports that personal growth and acts as a role model for it. And I'll give you an example in a minute. It is valid if it permeates every aspect of the particular educational community without exception. It is a concept of self-actualization for all as opposed to the concept of education for outside success where the primary focus is on what one can do rather than one what one uh, rather than who one is as a human being. And one of the first people to really recognize how important Anna Marie really was in the world is Tom Chemnitz. Tom, would you stand up? Tom published Anna Marie's first book, Educating Children for Life, the Modern Learning Community. And he reissued this book and put a new fancy cover on it. It used to be white, if those of you have it in your library. Uh, if you really want to understand the philosophy, if you want to understand how to build a school based on this philosophy, this is the Bible. This is what you want to get. And Tom has a booth here where you can get it. One of the examples, this is my favorite example, is that in most schools, the best parking place is reserved for the principal. And Anna Marie said, 
that at the Roper School, it would be inappropriate to give the principal the best parking place because the principal doesn't carry in as much as maybe the kindergarten teacher. <laughs> so there's an, the hierarchy of principal is here, teacher is here, student is here, isn't even shown in the parking lot. And I'm sure the two of you from the Roper School could come up with even more examples. But th that was one that I just adore. So, okay, so where did this idea of you're only gifted when you're producing something gifted start? It's a very old idea and it, it predates the child-centered perspective. It comes from the initiation of this field, not gifted education, but the study and, and description of and recognition of giftedness is a legacy of Sir Francis Galton. In 1869, he wrote Hereditary Genius. Now, I'm going to give you some quotes from his book that I think are important for us to understand where we are in our field today in relation to Galton. It follows that the men who achieve eminence and those who are naturally capable are to a large extent identical. If a man is gifted, use the word gifted, with vast intellectual ability, eagerness to work, and power of working, I cannot comprehend how such a man should be repressed. A very gifted man will always rise, as I believe, to eminence. The cream always rises to the top. That's where that came from. But if he is handicapped with the weight of a wife and children in the race of life, he cannot be expected to keep as much to the front as if he were single. He cannot pursue his favorite subject of study with the same absorbing passion as if he had no pressing calls on his attention, no domestic sorrows, anxieties, and petty cares, no yearly child, no periodical infantine epidemics, no constant professional toil for the maintenance of a large family. He did not have children. <laughs> So along came a feisty young feminist <laughs> named Lita Stetter Hollingworth. And she fought with Galton. In her book, the book that started this field, in 1926, she's dueling with Galton the whole time. Because Galton died before she even entered graduate school, but that's okay. You th he, was, he was very much alive in her mind. And she took that particular quote that I just gave, and she was interested in the girls who tested above 170 IQ, and what would happen to them? Would they become eminent? It will be of social value to observe the deflections from possible eminence which they meet, and to see how many will survive domestic sorrows, anxieties, and petty cares, a yearly child, and periodical infantine epidemics. Because, of course, the women were the caretakers, and she said, housekeeping is a field where eminence is not possible. So, okay, what are we doing here? I want to go back to Galton and um, see what he meant by eminence. He said, it's reputation and the way he determined for hereditary genius who was eminent enough to be recognized was the opinion of their contemporaries revised by posterity, the favorable result of critical analysis of each man's character by many biographers. So at one time, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I heard that uh, a study was done of who uh, actually won that contest in the United States. And I'll show you that in a minute, but I call this the posthumous definition of giftedness because you have to wait until the kid has died and see if books were written about him before we can decide if he gets into a gifted program. Uh, so, 
<laughs> the winner of the competition of biographies at one time was Seabiscuit. So here we have two basic viewpoints of what giftedness is all about. Men of high ability who work hard will ultimately attain eminence. This is still kicking and alive and very well. And then we have Lita's view, gifted children experience psychosocial adjustment difficulties by virtue of their developmental differences. One is a very patriarchal view, and one is a very feminist view, and they're still at war. So let's talk about ethics. Now we're getting, now we're getting down to the core of things. Lita Hollingworth believed, and Anna Marie believed, that there is no point at all in gifted education unless there's an ethical component to the instruction, unless we are, are bringing to life ethical citizens, is it no longer important? Have we outgrown the need for ethics? This is not a rhetorical question, folks. I need to know what you think. Have we outgrown the need for ethics? No, absolutely not. More than ever. Why? What's the point? Isn't it all about just success? The problems that are out there, you don't even know what they are yet. So you've got to have something tangible to count on when those problems arise. Yes. Between respectful and kind to each other, period. Will you say more about that, Susan? <laughs> Survival of the planet. Well, because it's not just the people in the school. That's, that, that's pretty much what Anna Marie would have said if she were here. That's why she talked about interdependence and self-actualization together. That you, you really do have to recognize that every single act has a ripple effect, affects everyone else, the entire planet. And that's, she believed that to her very core. And so did Lita Hollingworth, and it was built into the Spire School curriculum. This is an important question, and um, I have questioned whether people think ethics is important. Distinguished by their empathy and integrity, Lita and Anna Marie valued ethical development above achievement. They taught gifted children respect for humanity and commitment to service. They inspire us to honor the individuality of every child entrusted in our care. These were the values that both of them infused in their learning environments that they created. Lita Hollingworth in New York City, Anna Marie in Detroit. Basic respect for humanity, awareness of our global interdependence, and commitment to service. Now, Carol Ruth Harris and Willard White are two of the researchers. The third one would be Kathy Carney, but she hasn't written a book yet. Tom Chemnitz is on her heels all the time to write that book. But uh, they are three researchers who have gone back to the Spire School students grown up and said, you know, what was that like for you? What did you learn from it? How did it shape your life? What did it do for you? Willard White's uh, responses, uh, life-changing, are in 
America's First Gifted program. But Carol Ruth asked, from your point of view, what constitutes success in life? And their answers for the Hollingworth group were very different from the Terman group. Social and societal connectedness, awareness, compassion for others. 70 years later, those were the values and those were their definitions of success. Inextricably in interwoven with self-actualization and sensitivity to the needs of others. And uh, Carol lives here in Florida, in Maitland. Um, this is a wonderful piece of work. And it was the basis of her dissertation at Columbia University. Ethics is the centerpiece of Anna Marie's philosophy. Education should also deal with ethical questions. It should be focused on the emotional, moral, and ethical development of the student, rather than on preparation for success in the work world. Success in traditional terms is likely to be a natural byproduct of an education based on the individual needs of the child. Educators must forget about preparing children for the next step. Rather, the next step should adapt to the child. Anna Marie developed QA, qualitative assessment. And uh, her particular type of qualitative assessment is called the Anna Marie Roper method of qualitative assessment. The number one question that you ask is, who is this child? And Lita Hollingworth, for the Spire School, had home visits twice a year for all of the children, getting to know who is this child. And Anne Benevente, who has taken over as the director of Anna Marie's qualitative assessment, conducts the QAs in the child's home environment. And so does Linda Levitin, both of whom were trained by Anna Marie. This is um, one of my favorite Anna Marie quotes. If we really listen to the children, we will find an undiscovered gold mine of images, imagination, playfulness, love, and longing. If we ignore this, we might injure their souls. Throughout the history of science, and Michael would know this and be able to tell you more about it, he's uh, not only a counseling psychologist, but a molecular biologist with two PhDs. Throughout the history of science, two independent researchers in two different countries often made the same discoveries from a non-competitive worldview where it doesn't matter who gets the credit, independent observations verify the existence of a phenomenon. The similarity of Lita's and Anna Marie's observations, philosophies, and conclusions validate the reality of the child-centered perspective. Two years ago, uh, John Wasserman and Kathy Carney and I presented on Lita Hollingworth for NAGC, uh, Sunday morning, I think it was, uh, and for the Conceptual Foundations Network. And um, Leslie and Marsha and Lori Lutz were all there from the Roper School. And their mouths were open <laughs> because everything I was saying about Lita, they knew was true of Anna Marie. So we tried to figure out why. What was the similarity? What, what made this happen? I did some research after that to see if Anna Marie had visited Maranao, uh, the school that Anna Marie's parents had started. Because before she died, Anna Marie did have a trip to Germany to visit schools. So it was possible. But I found that she got as far as Berlin, and she had a list of all the schools that she went to, and she never got to Maranau. So that wasn't the connection. The connection, I believe, is the hundredth monkey connection. If something is real, more than one person is going to independently discover it. 
that's the way reality works. So uh, I think they they saw what it what is there to be seen if we start looking. Lita and Anna Marie.